Well, greetings, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us again. Uh, today for agronomy, we're going to discuss plant diseases and insects. Now, these are both two different topics that we could spend weeks and weeks. Um, people have spent their entire careers on these on each of these different areas individually, and uh, it's something that you could have a lifelong career with going forward. Uh, but we're just going to dabble in them today, let you get some basics out of the way. So uh, I hope that maybe one day this might encourage you to dive into these fields. And it doesn't have to be just about plant diseases or just plant insects. There's a lot of different things out there you could use with those type of degrees. But as we look at plant diseases, uh, plant disease is defined as a progressive deviation from a plant's normal development, appearance, or function. So basically, a plant disease is just something that is different from the normal progression of that plant. Uh, whether it's a, it's a color, it's a, um, a, uh, how the fruit's developing, it really doesn't matter. Anything that's deviated from the original form of that plant is, is what we consider a plant disease. Now, some disease are worse, some disease are very minor we don't worry about them a whole lot but just kind of depends on what we're working with and what it means on the bottom line uh, on the economic scale for the producer but plant diseases uh they're really sus they have a susceptible host um, and a pathogen so two different things and they must have an environment so those are three things that must be present for all three to work so the host would be the plant the pathogen would be whatever is causing that issue, and then the environment has to be correct. Some pathogens cannot live uh, in certain environments, so we don't worry about some of those in in some of those uh, in certain environments. Whether it's cold, it's hot, it's wet, it's dry, doesn't really matter. But it can be biotic, which means it could be macro big stuff or micro little stuff. Are abiotic so it could be an environmental factor that uh, causes a plant disease but there's typically a symptom that is uh, that's visible in the plants that is a response to the pathogen um, it could any anything you can see uh, the, the fruit part the actual fruit part of the plant so if we're talking about wheat the seed head will st will be very uh, uh, puffy instead of being really tight-knit um, type like it would be in a normal presentation but as we we talk about plant disease we see this triangle here uh, we see the we see the three different things that we just discussed must be there uh, one is a plant pathogen two is a po the host uh, and then we have the environment and all three of those have to be in place for us to actually have a plant disease take place so as we dive into the pathogen side of things we have li these are basically living organisms that can cause disease and whether they're one cell no cell just depends um, but they basically obligate paras their uh, obligate parasites or saprophytes now a lot of these include and these are some terms you might generally be used to is fungi bacteria viruses microplasma, uh, nematodes, parasitic plants. Those are things that we're going to try to cover today and try to get some a little bit better understanding of what they are. And we'll see a few examples as we move through. Now if we look at these three pictures of these digital leaves right here, um, we have fungal symptoms uh, up on the top left hand corner. We see the spots on it. We have bacterial problems or symptoms. We have still spots there, but if we notice there's kind of a halo situation going around the actual um, issue or the symptom that we're actually seeing. And if we see a viral type problem, typically we see large areas of the leaf become discolored um, like you see right there on that bottom leaf. But if we look at fungi, uh, fungi are composed of filamentous threads, and these enter uh, by the natural openings, injuries, or wounds, or even some direct penetration, depending on which fungi we're actually talking about. So uh, if we think about on the bottom side of a leaf, we have stomas. Well, 
that stoma is a natural opening that can uh, actually cause uh, a virus to be able to get in or a fungus to be able to get inside the actual leaf or into, of the plant. We have injury, so maybe it's wildlife walking through a field. It's us walking through a field. It's us um, trying to be good agronomists, maybe applying a fertilizer or soil nutrients uh, to the actual ground so we can feed these plants. Uh, so that can cause injury or wounds. So we have a lot of different ways we can get there. And some of them sometimes may be actually caused by us as humans. So we got to remember that. Symptoms include some of those symptoms include leaf spots. We can get blights, wilts, uh, rots, or some cankers. Um, those are all fungus. So if we think about cankers, um, and if y'all were around this part of the world in 2011, it was extremely dry. Um, the kind of dryness uh, 80 year old men at the coffee shop talk about that they've never seen it this bad. And a lot of post oak trees we don't have a lot on uh, the west side of 35 but if you get on the east side of i-35 we have a lot of post oak trees uh, not live oaks like you see on campus but a post oak tree a little bit different type of tree but still part of the oak family um, the oak tree naturally has hypoxylon canker on it well that hypoxylon canker doesn't really take over until that tree's stress level or immune system is down. Well, in 2011, it was so dry, those trees were hurting, that their immune system dropped, and we saw a lot of tree death uh, because of hypoxylon canker. And so that's a fungus that's already out there on the landscape. Uh, it just had the right environment to take over in the dry scenario, as well as the host their immune system was actually down. But a lot of times, most plants can fight off a lot of funguses if they're healthy and have everything they need. But in a field crop, we can manage it by several ways. We can manage it by crop rotation. Uh, we can plant disease-free seed. So that's one way we can move it around is by we harvest seed that had the fungus on there. Uh, we can remove debris where it can kind of hang out or over winter. Um, or we could use a fungicide, which is a very low level um, type of pesticide we can use on them. But we have some different types of fungal disease and we'll see some pictures of them. We have rust. Uh, we'll see a picture of some rust on wheat where, where it's really prominent. Uh, dampening off, we see this in greenhouses a lot. Even in some pl plants we plant outside, uh, grow from seed, if we don't have the right conditions, dampening off can happen. Uh, scab or uh, erot. Uh, erot is a fungal disease that actually affects the seed head itself of uh, any type of cereal grain. So a lot of times oats and wheat uh, is where we see it a lot of times or even in ryegrass and that fungus can be harmful to animals as well uh, but the head gets a, like a mold basically in there. You, there is what we call rice blast. It only affects the rice plant typically. Powdery mildew. Uh, a lot of times the powdery mildew will only grow. We think about powdery mildew a lot on landscape crops that may have a large aphid problem. And we see all the black smut on there and sometimes that's white smut, but that's what we're looking at. Uh, uh, we get some different types of smuts and then we have some diseases that are after harvest that can actually show up uh, with on the, within the seed itself. But if we look at the life cycle of a stem rust uh, fungus, if we notice uh, how we get from year to year, we have, we basically have these spores right here on the top of the screen that affect the wheat. Well, um, as these spores affect the wheat, as they go through late simmer, we have or uh, late summer, excuse me, we have wheat stem, uh, the red stage right here. And this is where we, this is a classic sign for us to really see it. And then the, the wheat stem, uh, the actual rust turns black on it. And then it falls off. Well, over winter, it just kind of hangs out. It says, hey, you know what? I'm not doing anything. I'm still alive, still going on. Um, and then we actually get these blastidium right here uh, and this actually affects the leaves a little bit and then so as we come into the summer right before we harvest um, we have uh, the spores that get on during the summer early summer and then the late summer we have it and then we just it just keeps growing and growing uh, throughout the entire process 
and um, that's something that we really have to pay attention to over over the years but um, looking at a real picture uh, here's some uh, some some rust on some wheat um, this is how we clinic we classically identify it besides taking samples and sending it off to a lab and letting them culture it ahead of time but uh, a lot of our genetic a lot of our varieties of wheat now are that are out there are actually um, engineered so we have bred the rust out of them so they can withstand it so if they do if they do get it it's no problem um, or we'll actually see uh, us rotate crops instead of putting wheat in the ground we may put oats in the ground or we may actually put a, a warm season crop in like corn or milo or, or something like that something different that rust cannot affect and then it doesn't have a basically a host to live off of for it to reproduce and try to live another day but when we move to bacteria bacteria are microscopic single-celled organisms they present uh, on plant surfaces uh, and they survive on plant exudates so anything left over uh, from the plant but a lot of our symptoms we can get are what we consider leaf spots or wilts or stunting or yellowing so as we go through these I want you to realize we're gonna see some of the same symptoms show up on plants uh, but it's up to us to determine is it from a bacteria is it from a fungus is it from one of these other diseases out there so there's really a story to be told when we start identifying that. So when we start looking at it, it's kind of like NCIS or uh, um, any of the other shows, the, the murder mystery shows where they, they go through and they, they do an autopsy of the, of the deceased. And we do that same thing in a, in a plant world. We just don't have, get to have TV shows about it. But a lot of our management includes uh, disease resistant varieties so we buy we buy genetics in plants that are resistant to those uh, different bacteria uh, we rotate crops and we actually sanitize so some between certain crops we may actually have to go through and clean our equipment um, just like if we were looking at uh, if we were trying to prune any type of large crop we typically like to clean and basically disinfect our pruning material our pruning shears uh, so we don't transfer any type of disease from plant to plant and that becomes a very big issue if we look at types of bacteria in these diseases here's some examples uh, the one on top the crown gall if we follow the red arrow all the way over to the right um, that is what we consider a crown gall looks looks to be on some uh, dewberry or blueberry or blackberry plants excuse me dewberries if you're from the south i guess um, but we see that large mass uh, that uh, that is growing on that plant itself and really probably hindered it if we could see the whole plant we get bacterial blight of the beads and so that's where we were talking about blight uh, if we notice the halo section we have the really dark section in the middle that's almost dead plant material and then we have that halo area right around there very significant of uh, of blight within any type of crop so if you see that halo typically that might be the problem and then on the bottom uh, because uh, sometimes our bacteria don't affect the actual leaf but the product itself so if we look at this common scab on a potato uh, that bottom picture on the right almost right dead center of your screen on the bottom um, those are a scab within the actual potato. So uh, within the potato industry, we see that that is not a presentable potato. Uh, is, it, is it still edible? Absolutely. Is it, uh, would it sell if it was on the shelf of HEB right now? Uh, probably not. Uh, it'd be one of the last ones to be picked through. Um, but product is still edible. Uh, we can still harvest it. We can still take it through the process. Uh, we just may, may come out in a further processed type situation. So some pre-made, uh, some cut uh, french fries or some diced up uh, hash browns, things like that. Uh, we can still get use out of it. We just don't get the high volume, high return on our investment as far as trying to get it out to the, to the right place. If we look at a virus, viruses are very small, simple pathogens. Um, typically they need a, some type of wound for transmission but 
a lot of times our virus we'll see will be stunting of certain plants uh, some tissue deformality some chlorosis or vein clearing so uh, we'll see some of the a picture of that coming up and uh, we have uh, managed in the management of those how we get rid of them we try to find virus free seed that should probably be number one on your list we want to try to sanitize our equipment if we think it's out there and we just really need to try to find resistant varieties for that so over time researchers have found um, varieties of plants uh, they've tried to breed them or some plants are just uh, more naturally uh, can fight against it we just try to use those varieties a little bit uh, and manage them a little bit different so we can still reap the, the crop off of there but if we look at types of viral disease, uh, we have tobacco mosaic virus. And so what you're seeing a picture here is actually of uh, a yellow mosaic virus on beans. Um, and so what you see is the leaf, you see the discoloration of the leaf. And so if we have that discoloration, there's no chlorophyll there. We're not taking in near enough, ener we're not making in there enough energy off of the plant. So our, our product will be half as less or more uh, we see a, a very drastic drop in our overall uh, crop harvest data whenever we try to analyze it at the end. But if we look at uh, transmission of viruses, insects end, to be, end up being a large part of that. Now, here are two examples, the corn plant hopper and the black face leaf hopper. These are two, two insects that can transmit viruses uh, because of the way they actually uh, um, affect the plant they, they cause some type of injury on them infecting it and so as they jump from plant to plant to plant well guess what now we have a perfect scenario to, to spread that actual virus uh, and affect more plants but if we look at another example maybe barley yellow dwarf virus uh, or sometimes you might read uh, BYDV uh, as an acronym the world loves acronyms these days right and so if we look on our left, we see the green plant. That's a very healthy wheat plant. Uh, very, still pretty young, pretty juvenile as, in its growth. But if we look at the yellow one, we see down towards the bottom, close to the, the person's thumbs that are holding it, it's still got a little green there. So we've still got some activity happening, but that's actually infected wheat uh, of BYDV. Uh, barley yellow dwarf virus so that's one thing that we need to try to be mindful of um, going through going forward is we need we still need to be able to identify a very healthy plant versus an infected plant because if you know what a healthy plant looks like typically you can see what an infected plant looks like in any crop very very easily uh, you can just look at them and say man something something just ain't right there so then you start investigating and seeing what the problem is as we look at uh, microplasma li like organisms um, they're very microscopic organisms very similar to bacteria but they lack a very tr they lack a true cell wall and so we have a hard time growing them within the laboratory so a lot of times we look at them just underneath the microscope off a real life specimen but a lot these are a lot of times are transmitted by insects uh, and the symptoms a lot of times we'll see a gradual yellowing or reddening of the leaves uh, stunting of that plant a smaller we'll see a lot smaller leaf than we're probably used to and then over time we'll generally see a decline within that plant uh, but if we want to go and use Google good old Google and f try to find our um, try to find one I would try to look at Astor's yellow disease uh, the plant will turn yellow over time smaller leaves very easy to notice as we're going through now nematodes are one that um, actually are in the soil this is one that uh, kind of stays in the soil but they're very uh, microscopic roundworms and we'll see a picture of them here coming up but they feed on plants using a stylet, basically a, a little bitty uh, nose that uh, that basically feed on the roots, a part of the of the plant. But we'll see a lot of symptoms uh, from stunting, wilting to chlorosis, basically uh, kind of bleaching of the leaf, uh, we could say. Um, sorry about that, uh, but. Uh, 
for nematodes are pretty easy to control um, other than maybe using a, fu a fumigant is crop rotation certain nematodes only like certain kind of crops um, or we actually have some varieties in some crop case in some crops that actually allow us to just change varieties uh, that can withstand them a little bit more but we get root knot nematodes or soybean yeast nematodes so it's really on a case-by-case -case basis what we're looking at, but generally nematodes are not a great thing. Um, so here we have a, a, a soybean cyst nematode. We actually see a picture of it right here. We can see the particles that they've consumed right through the middle of it. Um, then on our right-hand picture, we actually see uh, the cysts themselves um, actually on there, as well as we actually have some eggs that they've laid to help them reproduce and become uh, try to produce more. So that's where we really need to be on top of our game and, and monitoring that. And a lot of times you'll, if you pull up a, a nematode affected plant, you'll see uh, just large knobs. Uh, I say knobs are like a little bitty nut on some root hairs. And that's typically very iconic of uh, some type of nematode. Now, if we look at... Uh, Parasitic flowering plants, uh, they obligate parasites that lock root systems uh, and sometimes chlorophyll or lack root systems, excuse me. Um, and so they they don't look like a real big plant, uh, but they um, they definitely can can take away from our, agro our agronomic, agronomic crop that we're trying to grow. And this uses specialized roots attached to the plant's host to absorb water and nutrients. So basically, it is robbing everything it needs from the host plant. Because um, it doesn't really have roots. Or it has roots, but it basically ties into the host plants. And so they're, com they're obviously always stealing nutrients as far as that goes. But um, a lot of times when we try to manage it, we just try to prevent it all the way together. Uh, we can do hand removal. There are some herbicides out there we can use, and we can use we can actually use resistant plants and to and tolerant varieties. Now, resistant plants means they're not going to grow there. Now, if we look at tolerant plants, which means they can withstand so a little bit of damage from them, and we won't see a decline in our overall uh, crop production. But if you want to look up uh, daughter or witch weed, uh, those are two options for you to look at real fast just to see, uh, see what everything looks like. Now if we look at insects, um, we consider kind of an insect a small invertebrate animal. Uh, we have... Now if we move to Insects, uh, inspe insects are small invertebrate animals. Um, they have life cycles uh, within them. Uh, first one is an insect that has metamorphosis. Basically, they have four separate life cycles within their within their time period here. Um, there's incomplete metamorphosis where they where they hatch. Uh, from their egg they emerge from their egg and then they actually develop some adult features so they're kind of they kind of uh, come out of the egg with partially all the way uh, complete but then they grow some of the adult features once they finally hit a maturity stage and then some insects have no metamorphosis. So basically they have the same features throughout life cycle. They may begin on a juvenile scale, a lot smaller, but then they grow, uh, but they keep the same thing throughout the entire time. But um, a lot of our insects, or all our insects, have uh, different feeding habits. Uh, they can be either chewing, piercing, or sucking. So depending on what type of bug we're talking about determines on what type of damage we see. So if we think about grasshoppers, Grasshoppers are chewers. We're going to see parts of the leaf actually removed by the chewing of the actual insect. Or maybe we have a corn earworm that we see typically in the, the very top tip part of a, a, a corn plant, uh, actually on the ear of corn itself, that's inside that ear just eating away. That's a chewing. Uh, we might have a piercing type insect such as an aphid uh, that may also do a little sucking aspect as well uh, to get their nutrients from. 
But as we look at meta, the, met, the different metamorphous uh, stages, we have no metamorphous uh, where they come out of the egg, they're juvenile, and then they grow. So they look exactly the same. We just, uh, they're juvenile in size, so smaller than the adult. We have incomplete metamorphous, uh, like, a, like a grasshopper per se. So they, come, they emerge out of the egg, and as they develop, they get bigger uh, out of the nymphs and they become more, more adult-like and they do develop some. Then we have complete metamorphosis, which in the common sense is basically our butterflies. Um, the, an egg, uh, then they come out as a larva or maybe even a caterpillar, we could also call them. And then they pupate. So they build a cocoon, they hibernate in there, they advance some more, and then they emerge out an adult, which we would think of as a butterfly. But if we look at some anatomy on insects, um, a lot, most of our insects have some type of antenna, and we look at the configuration of, of those antenna actually to help identify them. We have their eyes, uh, we have their, uh, if we're looking at a Pearson insect, um, the, so that'll be the picture on your right, as, we, as it points through, uh, we have that pointer and that actually pokes through the actual plant and tries to retrieve some nutrients for them uh, and that's the labrium uh, but if we look on a, let's say a chewing insect like a grasshopper uh, they have a mandible up front and those are basically two chewing fingers that grabs the plant and kind of breaks it up um, and then they actually would consume that from there but if we try to go through and look and maybe identify some, some insects that are very important to the agronomic state, uh, here's a pretty good list of them. Uh, first one is an aphid. Uh, aphids are real bad um, out there. Ladybugs uh, can take care of them quite a bit. We have a potato leafhopper. We have weevils. Uh, we can have weevils on actual the crop or post harvest the crop. So if you ever have bought, an, uh, or bought a bag of flour and it sat around a really, really long time and we saw some little bitty brown or blackish colored bugs, those are typically weevils. Uh, they'll basically destroy our grain. They eat the insides out and so the grain is not mar merchandisable. So we have to go through a cleaning process and take all those really light ones out because that's what's taken out of the, uh, just they take all the biomass out of the kernel itself. So um, we have a, a Colorado potato beetle. We have a corn earworm, a uh, European corn borer, and a grasshopper. Um, I, if I, I would recommend that you maybe go take two or three, two or three of these and actually uh, maybe do some of, your, some of your own research on them and be ready to tell me about them maybe on the exam standpoint. So the picture of the, the lime green colored soybean aphid, uh, that's very macro, that's, that's very, very uh, high magnification, somewhat high magnification. Uh, we can see them, they're just really hard to see that detail on them. And then we also have a Colorado potato beetle uh, that we see right there on a leaf of a plant that uh, just chews away at the leaves and actually at the stems of a plant. So uh, when we start seeing uh, problems with the plant we start looking on how what are they actually doing to the plant are they uh, are they piercing are they sucking insects are they chewing insects and then we that also helps us work on control measures how do we control them then we look at the life cycle of them so when we talk about controlling insects we really try to talk about IPM or integrated pest management uh, IPM is a concept uh, where we think that pests are always present. Um, we, we just keep that in our brain that we know they're going to be there. We have to figure out a way to prevent them from having high numbers and keep them in a financial check with um, practices that we, pra that we use on our actual crops. But the objective is to keep uh, the pest population low. Uh, we never want to see all pests go away 100% because if we ever do that, we also could be hurting some of our beneficials. Let's say a, a ladybug, right? Everybody loves a good ladybug. Well, ladybugs are some ferocious dudes whenever it comes to trying to control pests. So, and if we spray anything to control some of the other ones, we don't have enough of those beneficials out there. But, um, 
we try to keep them in, in a low standard, which we also consider an economic scale uh, on what that number is and what, how bad, what's our population size in relationship to overall. So as we talk about insects, um, and the one thing we really need to talk about is IPM, Integrated Pest Management. IPM um, has a has a concept that basically all pests are always present, um, and we really just want to try to keep the pest populations on the low side of an economic scale uh, because if we we know they're there. We don't ever want to get rid of 100% of them because some of those could be beneficials, like the ladybug. Um, but we we also don't want them there that's actually going to have an economic threat to the crop because um, they just do so much damage to the actual crop. But it basically integrates a variety of management approaches. Uh, so IPM can be anything from uh, we're going to select genetics with a, within a species of crop that are resistant or tolerant of certain ones. Uh, maybe they have a genetic profile available that will resist them. So any bug, like uh, we have Bt. Uh, it's an, uh, Bt is a kind of a fungus somewhat um, that plants we can genetically engineer them to have. Uh, we can also spray it on as well uh, that basically attacks any type of insect on there. Guess what? Pretty natural, pretty safe. Uh, we can just have a plant that has that genetically in there. Uh, sometimes that uh, management approach has us actually applying some type of insecticide on them. Uh, whether it's a low level, high level fungicide, uh, really doesn't matter. But it's we we try to control them several different ways so they never get bad, um, and we can get away from having insects that are maybe tolerant to certain uh products out there that we could spray on them but at the end of the day ipm really the goal is to be cost effective and environmentally friendly so we don't want to we don't want to just spray all day that's not our goal our goal is to keep that minimum because anytime you cover that piece of country guess what it costs money um, there's application costs, there's equipment costs, there's somebody, there's a employee cost, there's product costs, there's breakdown costs, all that adds into it. And we don't want to put just a ton of products out there on the, on the landscape that we may not need, that we can do it a different way. So that's why we try to use multiple, um, a multiple variety of management uh, approach. So when we talk about IPM, here are some different ways that we can actually integrate pest management uh, to have a variety of modes for us trying to protect our crop. So uh, the big ones are, so the big titles are cultural, back, uh, biological, mechanical, genetic, and chemical. Now, cultural is more crop rotation, uh, irrigation, fertilization, uh, and sanitation side of things. But if we look at biological, we have beneficial insects. We have beneficial bacteria. We can use green manure where we grow a crop and just plow it under um, and use plant chemicals out there to help us uh, push some of those insects off. We also have mechanical uh, on small sides of the thing of the of the spectrum. We can have hand picking. So we go through and pick each individual bug off. Now, that's probably not good for aphids. But maybe if you are having, um, let's say, in a large tomato crop, um, you're actually you you only see so many bugs per plant per per square foot or square acre. Uh, we can actually go through and know say, hey, we need to go trap at least 500 of these. Well, we can all go out and hand pick them. We can trap them with pheromones. So we talked about uh, in the in the cotton industry how we use pheromones to trap the boll weevil. And so the boll weevil is one we can do that with. And then we look at tillage because some of those actually live in the soil and if we, uh, or they live on the plants that may be growing in between the crop rows that can house them, but they still come and feed on the, the actual crop. The next one is genetic, having the genetics available uh, that are resistant to those bugs or to those pests, and then there's always chemical. Using a product that is developed to, to attack 
certain insect uh, species. So it, it's really uh, becomes pretty, um, chemicals can be a great thing. We have to use them properly though. So we don't have any resistant bugs, meaning we spray it on them and they it doesn't kill them. So aphids, aphids basically reproduce every seven days. Uh, aphids, if you use the same product on them time after time, within about three months, they will actually be resistant to that, that product and you have to change product. So we need to make sure we're mining our P's and Q's. But if we look at chemical pest management, we won't go into big t detail on this, but we have disinfectants, uh, fungicides, nematicides that affect nematodes, antibiotics that help kind of boost maybe the immunity of a crop. Uh, Parasiticides that attack the actual bacteria that are out there and insecticides that actually affect insects. Now this is the end of the presentation. Um, uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to email me or shoot me a message through Blackboard. But thank you all for joining me today. Um, this is a very 30,000 feet view of, of, uh, of, of insects and IPM. Uh, we can definitely dive a lot deeper into this. Um, but we just want to get you a good taste. So hopefully y'all want to jump off in the agronomic industry and and take off and go rule the world. But thank y'all and hope everybody's staying safe and we'll, uh, we'll see y'all next trip.